Musica So what do we have here? The M1 carbine. That's what everybody knows it as. The military called it the US caliber 30 carbine. And uh, people that don't know a lot about guns think that it's an M1 Grand shortened because of the M1 distinction. But uh, us collectors, we know that the M1 carbine was something completely new, completely different. The round that it fired was completely new. It was just... Um, came out right before world war ii started it was like perfect timing and uh well before world war ii started for us let's say you know so it was it was perfect timing for us it was there just in the nick of time exactly when we needed it and uh it filled a niche that kind of uh you know we really felt that we needed and um it definitely filled a niche but i'm not really sure if it filled the one that we thought we needed you know we kind of thought we needed something for the background guys to carry that was a little bit more powerful than let's just say the 45 um caliber handgun the sidearm but uh you know we needed something less bulky than the m1 grand to carry around we needed some an intermediary thing and um this was kind of introduced as like a backline weapon they didn't expect this thing to really be up in the forefront too much but um as it turned out this thing, uh, you know, really kicked ass for our military in uh, in World War II, and I think it took a much more leading role than we originally um, had planned for it. Um, but uh, its uh, its design was actually started as a replacement. I don't know if necessarily a replacement, but it was the the M2 rifle it was going to be. It was going to be just a regular full-size rifle that fired the 3006. And um, a good buddy, a good buddy, John Browning's brother, uh, Ed Browning, was working on it. He died in 39 and kind of like left it unfinished. And then um, Winchester uh, called on um, Mr. Williams. That's David Marshall Williams. Everyone knows this guy as Carbine Williams. Um, you know, they made that movie with Jimmy Stewart about this guy. He didn't really play such a major role that the movie depicted him as playing. Um, he just kind of adapted um, his gas, short piston gas system, short stroke piston gas system into an already existing design from Ed Browning. And then they found that even the design from Ed Browning, the bolt, like just the way the action was, it didn't really seem to work too well. It didn't work under adverse conditions like sandy conditions. So then they called on a bunch of dudes from Winchester. Um, I'm not even going to sit here and name. There's just a ton of names, a bunch of designers. They were all um, supervised by this guy, Edwin Pugsley, though. Ed Edwin Pugsley is the name that everybody knows of as the Winchester guy that kind of put it all together. And they uh, perfected this rifle using um, using kind of like a lot of M1 Garand designs, like the M1 Garand bolt and operating rod um, design. Uh, let's see. What else? They, they actually... Um, do you remember the Winchester 1903 that we did in here? It had that that uh had the chamber that was kind of pitted so i was having issues with it it fired that proprietary 22 winchester um uh, rimfire cartridge well you know that there's a 1905 that kind of follows that same design same designer tc johnson um those were chambered in 32 winchester self-loading and 35 winchester self-loading two proprietary cartridges as well um, for that rifle, I believe. But I know that they were, they're were they old, out. they're already, like, you know, long-gone cartridges. Well, 
uh, Winchester actually used this Edwin Pugsley in his supervising knowledge. They actually used the trigger housing and lock work of the 1905 and used a modified grand op rod. And uh, they actually came up with a prototype that uh, was, um, that's what really made this thing be able to go into production and be designed for real was that that combination of things worked so it was really a whole bunch of people a whole bunch of designs a whole bunch of stuff that all came together that of course is a very rudimentary explanation of how it happened but um if you're a 19 a winchester 1905 fan um you'll know this because you'll You'll know exactly what parts. If you took one of these apart and you took a Winchester 1905 apart, you'd be able to easily identify what transferred over, you know. And, of course, you don't have to be um, that crazy of an M1 Grand uh, fan to see the similarities here in uh, how the bolt operates and how this works. I mean, that's very similar. Um, again, you have that... Uh, that delay here so as, like as the bullets traveling down the barrel we've been here before when it passes the uh gas port uh gas starts going down and pushing the piston so here it starts pushing here's the piston moving but you see the bolt doesn't move yet because if the bolt opened right away the bullet's still in the barrel here still around here somewhere tremendous pressure would blow out of out of the um out of this air as soon as the the bolt opened maybe even blow the cartridge case apart so you have that delay here so this delay from here to here is to allow the bullet to travel from as it passes the gas port to out the end of the barrel once it exits the barrel you're now at this point right here and you start opening actually you could also examine primary extraction right here if you want to study a little bit of that you see it's the twist and pull at the same time it's just like if you want to get a nail out of a wall you wouldn't just pull it like this. You wouldn't go anywhere. You twist and pull to get a nail out. Same thing that the gun does. It twists and pulls at the same time. That right there is called primary extraction. And then, uh, yeah, and there's a rotating bolt. It locks into position here. You see that even though the op rod here is completely open, the bolt will not go anywhere. It's locked in with these locking lugs here on the side. And it rotates to unlock those locking lugs. Very M1 Grandish. I mean, it's definitely taken from there. But uh, here we have detachable magazines that the uh, M1 Grand didn't have, which is one thing that made these very popular. Wartime, they had 15 round, also 30 round magazines. I, I'm stuck with 10 round magazines here due to um, state rules and regulations. But um, sky's the limit here. I mean, as long as you have a box magazine like this, uh, like in wartime, like I said, they had 15s, 30s, get whatever you want. Um, so let's see, let's, let's move into a little bit about this guy in particular. That's enough history because I'm bound to get something wrong and uh, probably already have 10 things wrong and I don't want to really piss people off. So let's just move into uh, <laughs> this particular rifle and or what what separates these um know that a tremendous amount of companies everybody knows this a tremendous amount of companies contributed to the war effort in making these and uh i have a book here let me see oh i didn't really have it ready that's bad let me see oh it actually just happens to be close to the page show you here by the way i always like to give credit this is a standard catalog of military firearms the collector's price and reference guide eighth edition this thing is like maybe four or five years old but it's uh philip peterson um even though the pricing on it might not be accurate what what's cool about books like this is that um even though the pricing isn't accurate you can see different types and the difference in the pricing that rarely changes um unless there's some huge cache of a certain variation that's found because then if a ton of those flood the market it could maybe lower the price of them or whatever which that never happens usually if the price of a rifle goes up these increments still stay the same you know what i mean so you could see if you had a certain version 
which ones are the more desirable. That's what's kind of cool about this book for me. Um, I could really care less what the bottom line is, to tell you the truth, unless if I'm buying, it's really just I'm out there looking so I know what they cost. Um, I don't really want to price my collection and, uh, you know, have in my mind exactly how much certain rifles cost. I really could care less. Um, I intend on just passing everything on anyway. But um, what's cool about this book is it could at least show you which ones are the more desirable ones, which that, that I kind of uh, like, that I have an interest in. Um, so you can see all the different receivers here and how they're marked and the different manufacturers. So we have Inland, Underwood, Saginaw, IBM, Quality Hardware, National Postal Meter, Standard Product, Rockola, who made um, jute boxes, which <laughs> this is an interesting uh, thing to transfer from making jute boxes to making rifles. And, um, and everything in between. There's, there's such a ton of information, okay, that... This is a really good rifle for that person that really loves to delve into the history and numbers and all kinds of little idiosyncrasies with manufacture and stuff like that. This is a gold mine for you because there were so many companies making these, then there were other companies making parts for them. And then not just that, but here, look, I got this, where is it? I got this paper here. Look, I printed this out from line. This is, um, this one is an IBM. So this is a paper just on some guy that's putting out um, just little idiosyncrasies just about the IBM. So you could look at any different manufacturer and have a paper like this with all their own, uh, with all their own little idiosyncrasies. But the stock and the handguard supplier, obviously they didn't make their own wood IBM. So... Rockola, Jamestown Lounge, Lumb Woodworking, Sprague and Carlton, Milton Bradley. Okay, so you see some of these, these guys didn't make rifles, they just made parts. There's another ton of companies that just made parts, subcontracting for parts. Um, see, IBM made their own barrels, they made their own bolts, receivers, and slides. Now... They have broken down here. There's other information that they have, how Inland shipped 10,000 bolts to them in 1943 and receivers and slides. National Postal Meter shipped 1,000 trigger housings to them in 43. There's all this information, Underwood, what Underwood shipped to them. So. If you're really looking for originality, you could look and you could say, oh, it's got a national postal meter uh, rear flip sight. So, uh, you know, that's been changed or whatever. That's that's not original. It could very well be original. It could be an arsenal re, uh, refurb. It could have left the factory that way. You know, so it's very difficult to determine originality because there's so many different little changes, but it seems like they kept such good records that people are able to come up with information like this. So uh, here, let's break it out. Let's break down this one exactly. So this guy, like I said, is an IBM. His manufacturer was 1943. That's when they started making IBMs. Uh, the IBM started at serial number 3,651,520 and ended at 4,009,999. For a total of, I have no idea. I had that written down somewhere. They made 364,500 of them. My serial number ends up where it would be the 3,698th one produced. So it's an early model. And then I'll show you what denotes the early model. I keep saying I'm going to tell you about this one specifically. But as soon as you start talking specific... There's so many little idiosyncrasies that all of a sudden you're branching off into something else. Let's just take a look at this one. Let's just see what it's got here. It's got a uh, butt plate, interestingly enough. See that one screw? That's supposedly the only thing it shares with the M1 Grand, is that they have the same screw that holds the buttstock in. That's what I've heard. Um, the sling passes through this uh, hole in the stock, and it uses this inside as a keeper for the sling and that is actually a little oiler this top unscrews oil goes in here and it has a little 
metal rod that you could use to uh, oil it up. Um, it has a stock that's kind of designed as a a, a um, made a made smaller M1 Grand. What is what would be the size of that? A um, reduced size M1 Grand stock. So it's modeled to the same dimensions. Um, you could see on here, in case I forget later, there's the little bomb crossed cannons uh, cartouche on there. Nothing else, though, just that. And, uh, oh, you know what I'll also forget? I know I'm going to forget this is. I don't know if this is trench art or someone did. I mean, someone could have done this in 1980, for all I know. Um, I have this rifle about six or seven years. But J Diamond with a Y... And he put a little diamond on there. Felt it necessary to uh, carve his name in here. You kind of hope that that's just some guy back in, you know, some guy back in like 43 or 44 that uh, marked that. But who knows? You'll never know. It's not like I could Google J Diamond with a Y and uh, something would come up. So, yeah, here's the... Uh, M1 Carbine, oh, I'm sorry, IBM Corporation. This is interesting in the fact that uh, they decided to put a uh, cross bolt safety, and it also has the magazine release as a button here, so there was confusion here. Just when you'd, you'd reach forward in a firefight and think that you're going to take your safety off, you press the button and drop the magazine into the mud. So not only would you have a uh, a gun with one round in the chamber, the safety would still be on, and you couldn't even fire that one round, and the rest of your magazine was uh, in a puddle. These That's one of the ways to find out if you have an early or a late model, by the way. This is another one. This, this gap right here where, the, where you see the operating rod. And uh, the sight, the rear sight... This one's a flip up. It's like 150, 300 yards, something like that, which is optimistic. They say operating range for this thing. It's not like it couldn't reach out to 300 yards, but we'll get to it later. We'll talk about the round. The round was kind of like a low powered round. It was kind of like a pistol round. So 300 yards was kind of pushing it. Say so like the effective range was really more like 200 yards. Um, this, uh, channel along the top of the handguard here is another way to denote earlier late models and uh, the barrel here in the front sight and uh, up here we have a IBM Corp 843 and they started making them IBM started making these things in 843 so this is very early this is uh, 3000 and change off the line um, IBM, should we get into what, yeah, they made them from, they made them from, where are my dates? From 843 to 544, that's when IBM made them, um, that was the time period, so it wasn't even a year, you know what I mean? Wasn't even a year, see, like it was uh, 11 months, uh, I'm sorry, um, nine months, so, uh, yeah, so the early ones, the early ones have this safety. They changed this to a flip safety um, at a certain point. They changed the rear sight to be more of like a, a ramp adjustable sight. Kind of it had graduations for like uh, 50, 100, 150, 200, 250, 300 yards like that and it uh, also had a windage adjustment this doesn't have that you just, you just flip you just got excuse me two choices and that's that um the later these handguards the later ones had a thinner gap here um they had like high wood and low wood they would call it for the side here i guess this would be high wood because it covers more of the apparatus and the low wood it kind of had a channel here that left this more exposed and the newer ones had a barrel, a um, barrel band here that had a, um, a sleeve here that had a um, 
bayonet mount on the bottom right here. And uh, probably be popping up pictures of that stuff as we go. Um, so yeah, so IBM seems like an interesting company to be making um, rifles for the war effort, but you know, everybody was chipping in back then. And uh, they, they have an interesting history. They made uh, Browning Automatic Rifles, BARs. And uh, originally they were just supposed to make parts for the M1 carbine, but they were eventually selected as one of the companies to make full rifles. And they subcontract, subcontract, contracted out other companies to make some of the small parts. You know, so um, they also made bomb sites, engine parts, and if you look into it, it's really hard to come up with exactly what they made because a lot of that stuff was classified. But they were one of the producers that so that made so-called major ordnance items. That's what that it's grouped as. So they were considered like you know making some serious stuff. I mean, bomb sites you got those have to be made right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, can be dropping bombs on friendlies if, the, if those things are messed up. A um, couple of interesting anecdotes. The um, the president of IBM, Thomas Watson Sr., he set a 1% profit on all these products that they were making for the military. And he used that 1% profit, that money, to establish a fund for survivors of former IBM employees who were casualties of the war. You know, So, so that was pretty cool of them, you know. And uh, six million M1 carbines were made, okay? And only 346,500 were made um, by IBM. So they're pretty rare, you know? They are pretty rare um, of the uh, group of them, of all the different ones that you could find. I don't know if they're the rarest, but they're definitely uh, one, of the, uh, one of the contenders for the rarest. They were, if you're really into IBM stuff, I could throw down some, I have some pretty detailed info quickly. They were made in plant number four, which is in Poughkeepsie, New York. So all those people from Poughkeepsie. IBM was a New York company also. They were made in Poughkeepsie. And uh, some parts were made in a facility in Endicott, New York. But all of them were made in Poughkeepsie. Um, receivers, bolts, barrels, trigger housings. Uh, were made by them. Other parts were made by a subcontractor, like I said. Um, so there, they had certain numbers. Now, here's the thing. After I bought this thing, I bought it from a pretty reputable guy, a guy that kind of deals with just M1 Grands and M1 Carbines. You're going to pay a premium for these things. So the way I looked at it is, I don't mind paying a few hundred more for from a, a really reputable source and a guy that says, no, this one is pretty, you know, it's... It's not one of his top collector ones that were like sick money, but it was one of his ones that were in the rack of good ones. And uh, reason being, I'll zoom in a little bit here. Let me see if I can do that. Some of the things it has, like see on the extractor here, there's a WB. So WB on the extractor, those are IBM extractors. And you're going to see, I'm going to pull this up here and I'm going to show you uh, pictures. A really cool thing to do when you're researching little parts and things, correctness for stuff is act like you're a buyer, even though you're not buying it. Um, it's The internet will cater to a buyer and give them the most detailed information. A researcher, they don't really care so much about a researcher. They're like, yeah, whatever, who cares? Doesn't No one's going to, you know, just... Vo voluntarily give them themselves uh, tremendous amounts of time without there being some kind of like reward for the most part. I mean, that's not necessarily true. There's a lot of collectors out there that un, um, that unselfishly, um, is that the right term? Unselfishly? They, they definitely spend a lot of time of their own because it's, they're interested in a certain rifle or a certain niche to um, put a lot of information up online. But for the most part, I'm saying, if there's monetary stuff involved, the information is going to be very correct. And and uh, as you see, having a WB on the extractor denotes it as an IBM. Also, here's the um, 
barrel band over here, right? And you can see on here, there's a KVB. And uh, you see, I pull up here a photo that shows, lo and behold, that uh, that is also a correct IBM, um, a correct IBM part. Also, the fact that the front sight has an N on it. I don't know if you can see it. It's kind of hard to see. It's near the bottom here. See if I could tilt it right in the light and maybe catch it. I saw it there with a magnifying glass, but there is an N there uh, here, and the N is for uh, IBM. So there's a lot of uh, parts. Now, there was a lot of other stuff too, like what markings are supposed to be on the trigger guard, and you could look them all up. Is that on here? Oh, it was another paper I had that broke down like every manufacturer and what their letters markings were that would be on here or on there. I didn't want to go that crazy. I didn't really feel like taking this whole thing apart. So um, I didn't really research that. But one day, I'm going to buy a book. There's this book. Uh, let me see. I want to give this guy credit. Let's see if I can find where I learned about this book. Yeah, hold on. The book is, it's written by Larry L. Ruth. And it's called War Baby, with an exclamation point. War Baby, the U.S. Caliber 30 Carbine Collector Grade Publications from 1992. This is supposedly the uh, greatest book for um, the greatest book for um, M1 Carbines. And with that book, you could break down every little teeny thing about your... Uh, cause the stuff I'm reading is all excerpts from that book. But uh, here's the... Uh, well, that'll give you a show. Oh, there's another thing you could use. The the early ones, this hole here is shaped like an eye and not a, just an oval. So you can see here, Back Again to Military Firearms by Philip Peterson. I love this book. This is a good book. Um, you can see the eye here. This is the early ones. And uh, this is way early. It seems like um, the supplied stock for IBM actually turns out to be the second variation if this stock was in fact original from the factory is the oval and then uh later versions see it shows that adjustable site that's the site i was talking about that's the adjustable site and there's the bayonet mount and uh yeah so there are different versions. If you have a preference when you're buying, just make sure you, uh, you know, make sure you check into, make sure you check into it and you're getting uh, exactly the one that you want. So let's, uh, let's load it up. What do you say? So again, people familiar to this channel know all about uh, realistic snap caps. Let me show you. You can get into um, the round. Actually, I can tell you a little bit about that. I don't know much, but but uh, these realistic snap caps, check this out. I've had a couple of uh, comments on my videos lately where people are saying, like, you know, you're, you're loading live rounds and you're not using proper safety measures. Listen, I check these things before I even do the videos. I clear the rifles right before I hit record. And... Uh, we're safe because these things are totally inert. You should check these out if you've never seen them before. They're called, um, they're from realistic snap caps. They have completely realistic construction, real cases. These bullets are bonded into the cases, so they're not going to separate and come out after like thousands and thousands of cycles. They stay put. And the primer is really a silicone pad to protect uh, your firing pin when it hits it so you can safely drop the firing pin on these things. And um, look at how they're called realistic snap caps for a reason. And there's, I'm telling you, there's people that are thinking I'm loading real rounds. Well, check out the description uh, down below because um, there's a 10% uh, off coupon code there for you. These guys offer free shipping. What more could you ask for? 
I don't think you pay more than you would pay for uh, like regular rounds. They're almost they might be like just a little bit more, maybe close to like double the price. Of, but that's not much. Like here, here's a box of uh, PPU, thirty cal carbine. Right? Look at all the fun you have for twenty bucks. These are twenty bucks a box. You know, I don't think uh, ten of these is much more than. 20 bucks. I haven't looked on their website in a while, but not much of anything that they sell is more than 20 bucks. A set of these things are about that price, you know? These are a straight walled cartridge. They're like straight wall, but they're actually they're actually a tapered. Let me see. I had some stuff written down. Let me take a look. What did I write again? 110 grain projectile, 1970 feet per second. Tapered case. The um, they're made from the 32 Winchester self-loading cartridge, which was you saw I mentioned the Winchester 1905. The Winchester 1905 was chambered in a cartridge that ain't around no more. 32 Winchester self-loading cartridge. Um, it had a rim. They removed the rim. Winchester just removed the rim and used the freaking round. That was it. <laughs> it's the best thing to do is use something that you already have designed already and that's proven you know um now yeah it was kind of like a uh low powered round it was um they knew what they were making they didn't make it thinking it was gonna compete with the 3006 it was for background troops um as long as it was as powerful as the 45 uh, handgun that's all they were really interested in but it turned out being Lighter and more powerful than even the uh, 45 caliber submachine gun that the military was using then. And um, it, uh, it was either loved or hated, is what they say. That people either loved it or they hated it because they thought this round was inadequate. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a tough call. It really is, but... Uh, you know, I guess there's certain situations that demanded the power of a 3006, and there's other situations that demanded, you know, mobility and lightness and and speed um, in um, in a closer quarters. So you know, everything has its place, um, but uh, these things they they definitely, you know, when you play when you play Call of Duty and you shoot somebody three or four times and they don't go down, it is a little frustrating. So. <laughs> sure in real life when your life was on the line that was real frustrating you know what i mean so uh that's the story with these nice that's smooth so um yeah where were we where am i going now this happens a lot all of a sudden i i run out of stuff and then i'm like well now i'm just kind of like in the middle of everything hmm you know, some of these parts, some of these parts on here, unmarked is correct, believe it or not. Like, um, look at the front side over here. See how there's, see how there's an S? It's better to zoom. See, now I'm just going to bounce around all over the place. See how there's an S here? And you would think, oh, that's the mark. They all have that S. That means small side. Because if you look on the other side, it's wider. Because that's what gets this to actually fit into the dovetail and not just slide right through is that it's kind of like a tapered gap here. So this is the small side, so that's why they put an S there. On this side, there would be a mark here. And on, actually, there are a couple of marks that would denote IBM, but there's also, it's correct for an IBM if there's no mark. So then there you go. Perfect example of how you'll never know if that's the original site or not, just because of weird little stuff like that, you know? And uh, I hate when the video's over and then I'm like editing it and I go like, oh, we have to talk about that. Oh yeah, well, let's discuss the different versions. There was the regular M1 carbine version and there was an offshoot of that that had a, um, a uh, collapsible stock uh, called the paratrooper version. Then there was also an M2 version, which was Select Fire, which uh, came later on, that had a selector switch and was capable of semi-automatic or fully automatic fire. 
And then uh, there was an M3 version, which uh, this thing looked like it was right out of Buck Rogers. It had an infrared scope and an infrared lamp on it. And basically that lamp would shine in a spectrum of light that you wouldn't be able to see. But it shined like a flashlight. You just wouldn't be able to see anything lit up unless you were looking through the infrared scope. And supposedly, as hokey as that thing looks, supposedly it turned the tides in uh, Okinawa and was uh, very effective there. Let's back up a little bit. You know where you might remember this gun from? Do you remember when um, Al Pacino in Dog Day Afternoon was going to rob the bank? Uh, he had a, a box that looked like, you know, had like a ribbon on it and like a bow, like it was a flower box. And he um, he walked up to the counter, he handed her the note, and then he ripped the box open, and the ribbon was hanging off the rifle, and it just, it just it was an interesting scene to show how he was dangerous, but like weirdly inept, and um, and maybe uh, you know maybe mostly harmless kind of thing. But it was a, a very memorable scene to me. I always remembered him ripping that box open and struggling with the box to get it off the rifle and uh, that was an m1 carbine it was a much later version you know these it might look like these hang up a little bit like that or whatever but um just why these things are excellent for function testing you wouldn't want a function test like that with live ammo even the bolt could catch the primer in a weird way and set it off or if you had a sticking firing a sticky firing pin that was sticking out and you just bought a rifle and you slammed the bolt home like that uh you know you're putting around through the apartment so if it cycles the way it would cycle you know you can't baby these things in other words you can't you can't like pull it out like this and then want to go like that it's gonna hang up you know what i mean it's um it's completely gone i'll never find that again But if you if you operate the action like like you know rough like it would be like if it went bang and it falls from there it's gonna load every time. Um, yeah. So, oops, that's a double feed because I didn't let it. Uh, it's pretty easy to fix those too. If you had like a, let me show you an example. Say it doesn't. Extract those and clip on the rim. Oh, I don't have another round in there. Though. Let me let me put one in just to do this. It's like an M1 Garand where you don't really have to worry about it crushing your finger because there isn't as much pressure. So see if you get one of those going on. Like let's just say, let's just say you didn't realize that it didn't pick up this round and you went to cycle another one. You have a double feed going on. You could fix, you go up. You don't have to worry. The M1 grain, you can't stick your finger in there. With this, you could stick your finger in and actually hold the bolt back. It's not very powerful to, uh, you know, pick that one up. Let's say you could mess around with, uh, with, your, with your finger in there and not worry too much. So, uh, M1 carbine. Hmm. What a rifle. Yep. Well, thanks for hanging in there. <laughs> this is a tough one. I don't really know where to end with this one. Oh, I did have a little speech for the end. I'm sorry. All right. What I wanted to say was, um, see, I knew my closer was there. I just, I, my closer is that although they talk about how it's underpowered and it's, uh, it's real tiny. I mean, this thing is like the size, it's probably smaller than a Ruger 1022. For that reason, it's really good entry level for kids. Um, just you, you're basically, I don't want to like put anybody down. You know what I mean? I'm hesitant to say, you know, female because I've seen, I've seen women handle um, recoil that men cry from. So it's like, I don't want to just throw that down there and make a generalization. But um, anyone that's shy of recoil, anyone that, you know, they get in there and they're shooting like big bore rifles that are punching them in the shoulder and they're like, I, I don't really like this. You know what I mean? That, it happens sometimes. And it's like they would be into it if they could just get into it gradually. They just don't want to be like 
scared or beaten up. You know what I mean? It's like people can get into boxing if they just lightly spar and play around at the beginning. If they just get right in the ring with someone that punches them right in the face, they're going to be like, whoa, 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 hold up. This isn't for me. You know, so you need rifles like this to, it's very pleasant. You could get somebody into it where they're like, wow, yeah, this is cool. This is fun. And it's not a huge report and it's not a huge punch in the shoulder and it's not a huge, you know, it's not like a cannon going off. It's, it's good for kids. It's good to people that are recoil sensitive. Somebody that's just getting into this hobby. It's, uh, there aren't many of these military rifles that are like that. Most of these military rifles are made to just be like, just, just balls to the wall, all out as big of a punch as you can give. Obviously it's because they're playing for keeps, but, um, this guy was made with kind of like a different idea in mind. You know what I mean? And, uh, it's refreshing. It stands alone in that respect that it's, um, it's probably the best entry level, um, you know, a uh, rifle for somebody just getting into the shooting hobby of shooting military arms. And even the person, the shyest away from shooting would pull the trigger a couple of times. You'd be like, well, wow, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of cool. This thing is kind of cute. And that might be what you need to, uh, you know, bring somebody in that might otherwise shoot like a Steyr M95 and be like, forget it. I am not doing that. You know what I mean? So, so there you go. Turn a negative into a positive. If it's a negative that it was underpowered, uh, you know, we're not in war anymore. So let's turn that into a positive and maybe, uh, you know, bring some people in that might be a little afraid and start them here first, you know, and don't be afraid of the price because remember, you get what you pay for, you know, Mill Serp Garage. See you all soon. Take care. Yes, yeah, <laughs>